Good afternoon and welcome to today's Valisher video seminar, Our Risky Reliance on Chinese Drug Manufacturing. Thank you for joining us. My name is Peter Propp and I'm the Director of Marketing for Valisher. Now I'm pleased to introduce our moderator for today's webinar, Major Ryan Constantino. Ryan is the Director of Pharmacy Clinical Decision Support for the Defense Health Agency. He is also the current chair of the American Pharmacists Association Clinical Sciences Section, providing a unique multidisciplinary interaction between clinical scientists and practitioners committed to expanding knowledge of the safe and effective use of drug products. Ryan earned his Doctor of Pharmacy degree from the Massachusetts College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences in Boston, Mass, and a Master of Science in Pharmaceutical Health Service Research from the University of Maryland School of Pharmacy. He also completed a pharmacy resident at University of Maryland Medical Center, a PGY2 and fellowship in pain and palliative care at University of Maryland School of Pharmacy. Ryan is dual board certified as a pharmacotherapy specialist and a geriatric pharmacist. Thank you, Ryan, for being with us here today. Thank you, Peter, and uh, welcome to everyone who joined for today's webinar. In 2018, Americans filled approximately 5.8 billion prescriptions, with nearly one out of every two Americans taking at least one prescription daily. Global pharmaceutical production is estimated to be about a $2 trillion a year industry, with up to 80% of drugs produced overseas in India or China. Over the last several years, China has emerged as one of the leading and largest pharmaceutical producers in the world. Even when drugs are manufactured in India or other countries, they often rely on ingredients made only in China, which produces about 60% of the world's active pharmaceutical ingredients, otherwise known as APIs. And in the vast majority of the fine chemicals uh, that, that are used to make these APIs, the COVID-19 pandemic and the unprecedented pressure it's placed on the US drug supply highlights America's dependence on foreign-based pharmaceutical supply manufacturers, particularly China. Global disruptions tied to COVID-19 have sparked concerns that shuttered plants in China and elsewhere and will likely cause or have already caused drug shortages in the United States and in some cases, uh, result in medications that are being repurposed for COVID-19 treatment. In addition to the challenges of drug shortages, existing pharmaceutical quality problems can be exacerbated by the COVID-19 crisis. Many safety and quality issues stem from overseas manufacturers cutting corners, and it's certainly possible that many more corners will be cut in ramping up production and filling back orders. These concerns underscore the potential impact on the drug supply chain as well as the US's vulnerability on the overdependence on a single country for the supply of some of the United States' most vital medications. Today, we're pleased to have Rosemary Gibson and David Light speak to you on the issues inherent to America's reliance on China for our nation's drug supply. Our first presenter is Rosemary Gibson, author of the book, China Rx, Exposing Risks to the America's Dependence on China for Medicine. Rosemary received the highest honor from the American Medical Writers Association for outstanding contributions to reporting on critical health issues in the public interest. She is board chair at Altarium Institute, a nonprofit health systems research group in Ann Arbor, board member of the Accreditation Council for Graduate Medical Education, and served on the Clinical Learning Environment Review Evaluation Committee to advance patient safety in teaching hospitals. At Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, she architect the uh, $200 million national strategy to establish inpatient palliative care programs that now number 1,800, which is an increase from about 10 in the 1990s. She also received the Lifetime Achievement Award from the American Academy of Hospice and Palliative Medicine. She also worked with Bill Moyers on the PBS documentary, On Our Own Terms. Our second presenter will be David Light, founder and CEO of Valisur. David is a biotech entrepreneur and scientist with over 15 years of broad experience in the field. A graduate of Yale University, David studied molecular biology and has worked in a variety of scientific and business roles at startups like Synthetic Genomics, Ion Torrent, 
in Balashore. At Ion Torrent, David developed key technologies that directly led to the semiconductor DNA sequencing company's $725 million acquisition and ran its flagship technology programs through development and global commercialization. David is the founder and CEO of Balashore and helped found, fund, and invent the core technology. David is named inventor on numerous patents published in journals, including Nature and the cover of Electrophoresis, and has been invited to testify at congressional hearings, as well as speak at the U.S. Capitol building regarding medication safety and quality. And now I would like to turn it over to Rosemary. Uh, thank you, Ryan, uh, for that nice introduction. And I want to thank my uh, Valisher, David, and for this opportunity to uh, be with you this afternoon. I'm just going to uh, share my screen, so bear with me for just one moment. And then we'll get started. I'll be uh, talking about a subject matter that has, as Ryan mentioned, has become much more pronounced with the uh, coronavirus uh, pandemic. And that is our dependence on China for so many of the, our medicines, primarily the raw materials and active ingredients to make thousands of them. And I'm trying to advance my slides. And for some reason, it's not going. Oh, there we go. Uh, the presentation today is based on three years of research that went into uh, prepare the book, China RX, exposing the risks of our dependence on China. And in, it was, came out in 2018, and it actually predicted the current situation that we are in. It said that in the event of a natural disaster or global pandemic, the United States will be waiting in line with other countries for critical medicines as global demand increases and the supply is concentrated so heavily in a single country. I'd like to focus just on two points today to clarify how dependent is the United States on China for medicine. And as you'll see, it's not just the US, it's countries around the world. And second, to do a root cause analysis of how did we get here? So first, how dependent are we? I think it's always helpful to take a look back at where we were not that long ago in the lifetimes of most of us on this call. While researching China RX, I came across a fascinating report prepared at Oak Ridge National Laboratory and published in 1988. And it was a remarkable uh, technical document that highlighted where every single antibiotic fermentation plant was in the United States. And it was a how-to manual on what to do if for some reason they were damaged or destroyed. This was part of national security and homeland security, and it was a guide on how to repair them if they were damaged. In this document, it highlighted actually how much antibiotic production took place at each plant around the country. And it identified where penicillin, cephalosporins, tetracycline, and others. They had their locations, the contact name of the people who ran the plant, their phone numbers. So back in 1988, we were prepared and we had tremendous uh, industrial capacity. And this is just a, a slice of a, a map they have in the report that with the black dots showing where these plants were located. So we were prepared and we were self-sufficient. Let's fast forward to what emergency preparedness and in our industrial base looks like today. Today, we have virtually no capacity to manufacture the generic antibiotics. These are the medicines you give to your children and grandchildren for ear infections, you take for bronchitis or strep throat, for pneumonia, for sepsis, STDs, MRSA, and even anthrax exposure. It's worth repeating, we have virtually no capacity to make antibiotics. And these are part of our medical countermeasures for biosecurity. And these are some of the medicines that are needed uh, to treat COVID patients who get secondary infections. More broadly, beyond antibiotics, how dependent are we on China? 
I had the pleasure of interviewing many people in the industry while writing China RX. And Guy Vilax, the CEO of Hovion, who actually supplied the US government with doxycycline after the anthrax attacks in 2001. We couldn't make the doxycycline and he said he had to get the starting material from a plant in China. I asked him, how dependent are we? And he said, if China stopped exporting ingredients to the US, Within three months, all the, our pharmacies would be pretty empty. And put this in the context of a global pandemic where countries are lining up, basically competing with each other to obtain the same essential medicines we need. So how did we get here? The New York Times reported in 2004 about the closure of the last penicillin plant in the United States. This was announced in 2004. It was a Bristol Myers Squibb plant located in Syracuse, New York. But was, what was not reported was the backstory. Why did this huge industrial plant shut down? And China RX exposes how it happened. If you read in the chapter on the penicillin cartel, you'll understand why. I'd like to share with you data on what I call China's penicillin cartel. This data comes from the European Fine Chemicals Group. This was a slide presentation they had, and this is a group that produces the key starting materials uh, for thousands of our prescription drugs. And look at the subtitle on this slide. A 25-year landslide in the manufacture and business of active pharmaceutical ingredients in Europe. So what's happened in the United States has also happened in Europe. And the next slide shows the penicillin cartel and how it happened. In this bar graph, you can see the, the higher level bars. And that is and uh, raw material production for penicillin globally. Within each of those bars, you see a subset of bars, small, lesser height, and that's the growth in China's portion of the global market for penicillin material. And China did a very uh, strategic um, step as part of its industrial policy. In the 90s and perhaps earlier, it invested heavily in antibiotic fermentation capability. And what we began to see happen in 2004, and let me draw your attention to the yellow line on the graph, that's global price. Look over to the right and look what happened in 2004. The price dropped significantly and it was kept low for about four years. And during that four year period, again, beginning in 2004, that's when China drove out its competitors. It drove out the Bristol Myers Squibb plant and even drove out Indian capability to make penicillin raw material. So as China drove out its competitors, when that job was done, then it raised the price, as you can see the yellow line indicating that increase. And this is a playbook that uh, I've observed over and over again and reported in China RX. It happened with vitamin C, it happened with aspirin, and of course in other sectors of our economy, our steel sector, China dumps product on the global market at below market prices, and then drives out competitors and then raises the price. And so this is what happens when the prices go too low. And I say this to hospital CFOs, you're basically being subsidized by the Chinese government for now but how long is that going to continue? So this is how we've lost our capability. A lot of people think it's, well, lower cost in China, which is true, lower labor costs, environmental regulations are less, but this is not normal market functioning. This is antitrust illegal behavior, but no one ever um, did anything to stop it. I talk a lot about losing our industrial base, and I think it's really helpful to have a picture of what this means. This is an aerial photo of the Bristol Myers Squibb capability that once made 90, 70% of raw material for penicillin. 
And when announced it was closing, it began the process of demolishing 50 buildings on its campus. Tremendous capability. And once it's gone, it's gone. And the cost to bring it back is not insignificant. So that's, this is what we've lost in our country when we talk about the outsourcing of ingredient production, key starting materials, as well as API. We are losing the industrial base, the jobs that go with it, good paying jobs, our self-sufficiency, and our workforce. It's important to underscore that China's dominance is not just here, it's also global. This is a screenshot of a former industry official in Europe. He was with the European Fine Chemicals Group. And what was so fat, this was in the Dutch public television documentary that one of the comments he made was really fascinating. You know, people say that, you know, well, China could withhold our medicines because the US is in a trade kerfuffle with China. I was surprised to see that in Europe, which is not in a trade issue with China, this uh, industry official said, now we're afraid that China will do things to deprive us of our medications. This illustrates what happens when we lose our capability to produce products that are essential for life. If you control antibiotics and other medicines, you effectively control the world. You, it gives whoever controls it significant leverage. The uh, Dutch public television folks updated their documentary this, uh, this year with, in a COVID context. And this is where the gentleman from the industry talked about the global dependence on China for raw materials. He said, and now you can say that China owns the raw material market worldwide. So when people question, well, it's, oh, we can make drugs here in the US, the reality is as Ryan said, it's, we have to look at the key starting materials and to make the ingredients in our essential drugs. This uh, triangle here illustrates where this dependence rests. So at the, in the bottom of the triangle are the finished drugs. And I wanna credit Martin Van Trieste who had this triangle idea. Some said I should reverse it, put the finished drugs at the top, but here, here it is. So the finished drugs are at the bottom. These are the pills that we take, the vials of medicine that are administered to patients. And active pharmaceutical ingredients are what makes a medicine medicine. It gives it a therapeutic value. And then at the top are the raw materials, the key starting materials, the chemical intermediates to make the active ingredients. And China's chokehold is in those key starting materials. And as Ryan said, China also makes a lot of API. And it, it's very important to clarify on the right-hand side, the FDA regulates the API facilities and the finished drug facilities. And when it regulates those, that means that it has data on those facilities. They have to register with the FDA, they have to pay a fee. So the FDA, these are the ones that the FDA knows about and inspects. But what the FDA doesn't know about are the facilities that make the key starting materials. And I say this because when I testified before Congress last October, the FDA gave data on you know, where China has a chokehold and they focused on API and finished drugs. But that's because we're, that's the data they had. What they missed was, these things aren't made out of thin air, where the core chemicals come from, and that comes from China. So when you look at a lot of data, and I'll show you an example in a minute, it's very important that it not be misleading, that in fact, this is where China's chokehold is at the tip of the triangle. Now, China is rapidly moving up the value chain. It has nearly 10% of the US generic uh, market share, and that was achieved in just about 10 years. And here are some labels of selected generics made in China by its domestic companies and sold here in the US. This is the antibiotic doxycycline. I'm told that the uh, fermentation plant to make this is in Inner Mongolia or perhaps, perhaps in Kazakhstan, and the FDA does not inspect these facilities. Chemotherapy products made in China by its domestic companies, antidepressants, birth control pills, Alzheimer's, HIV AIDS, and much more. And it's important to underscore that these generic companies are also being subsidized by the Chinese government because its aim is to become the pharmacy to the world. It's a stated aim. 
and it's using this, I believe it will use the same playbook, just as it's driven out the raw material producers, it will eventually use the same strategy to undercut other generic companies to drive them out of business and then gain dominant global market share. What we're seeing is the collapse of Western generic trunk drug companies. Mylan announced last year that it was merging with Pfizer's generics. And then two of the other largest Western generic companies, Teva and Sandoz, they announced early last year that they're dropping about half their products. And the reason is that they just can't be competitive in the global market. So Western generic drug making is collapsing. We saw the collapse of the penicillin raw material market API market, and now going upstream to the finished drugs, the pills that we take. And meanwhile, last year, Pfizer announced that its generic drug unit was opening its global headquarters in Shanghai. And remember, generics are 90% of the medicines that we take. And this means that we, we and the world are losing our capacity to make the most essential drugs necessary for our healthcare systems to function in the best of times and certainly uh, during a global pandemic. So China makes 8.5, I'm, up I'm upping that to about 10%. India makes about 25% of our generic drugs. So that would seem, well, that's fine. If India is making 25% of our drugs, we don't need to worry about that. But in fact, as Ryan alluded to in the introduction, India depends on China a great deal for some of those starting materials. India is dependent on China for those raw materials and chemical intermediates. And it came out during the pandemic that 69% of those raw materials, those key starting materials that India requires for its giant generic industry, industry are sourced in China. And this is why India was putting in part, putting export bans on because it couldn't get this starting material from China for its own sector. I want to go back to what I call a regrettable statements. I, I wrote China RX in the public interest. I think it's imperative that the public and policymakers, those who are concerned about our national security, our health security, have accurate information. China RX has 900 footnotes documented exceedingly carefully. No one paid me to do this work. It's solely done in the public interest. And then I, you pick up different media and you see here that US Chamber of Commerce saying, nothing to see here, US manufacturers already meet 70% of current pharmaceutical demand. If that were true, we wouldn't have drug shortages. It's simply not true for the reasons of going back to that triangle. We can't do pharmaceutical manufacturing here without those key starting materials and those active pharmaceutical ingredients. And where the, most of the outsourcing has taken place for the API is, is for the generic drugs, branded products, those APIs are more likely to be made outside of China. But even the branded products, right, like remdesivir, a very senior official said that some of the components to make remdesivir need to be sourced from China. So it's, it's so important for policymakers and all of us to have an understanding of our dependence, where we're dependent, and for what products. And I think the essential generic drugs are particularly challenging when it comes to that dependence. In fact, I asked a group of pharmaceutical engineers sitting around a dinner one night, so the COVID drugs that patients need to recover while they're in the hospital, the sedatives, the norepinephrine, the lidocaine, all these things, where are those key starting materials sourced? And went around the table and each of them said at least 90% of the key starting materials to make the COVID drugs that hospitals have been using to help patients recover are sourced from China. One of the other lessons we've learned from the coronavirus pandemic is that countries will uh, shut their doors on exports of critical medicines and keep them for their own populations. More than 70 countries indeed banned exports of medicines and or supplies, including, including half the countries in the EU, which, which is a site of some manufacturing. The UK banned parallel exports of key drugs to protect supplies. And this heightened the, heightened the realization that in the middle of a global pandemic, we need quality drugs, but we also need to have some minimal degree of self-sufficiency 
to ensure we have the medicines we need to care for people. And finally, I'll, I'll close with this really compelling uh, statement that was, this is more about the quality side and also our supply chain. There was a hearing last summer where I had the privilege of testifying, the US-China Economic and Security Review Commission. And in the course of that hearing, one of the commissioners uh, spoke up about his own personal experience with his prescription drugs, specifically his blood pressure medicine. His name is uh, Dr. Larry Wurzel. He's 32 year army colonel retired, used to teach at the army war college. And he's talked about his blood pressure medicines being contaminated with rocket fuel chemicals. And those, the active ingredients were sourced from China. And he said, I imagine active duty people, those in the military now have the same problem. And this affects the readiness of our troops. So this is a widespread problem. It, whether you're rich or poor, wherever you hail from, uh, this is a, a challenge that we all face. So I'm gonna stop there, there's China Rx, and I hope you will reach out to me. There's my email address, and follow me on Twitter at Rosemary100 for updates on what's going on. Oh, and by the way, the other thing I wanna say is, you know, the FDA is no longer, has ceased doing overseas inspections because of coronavirus. And I, I said in China Rx, it's going to come a time where the FDA won't be able to really do its job in, in China for a variety of reasons. And lo and behold, this past weekend, there was an advisory issued by the U.S. State Department uh, advising Americans considering going to China that um, there is a concern about um, Americans being detained in China and even a barred from uh, leaving the country. To come home. So that's another, I call, I put this out on Twitter, it's another nail in the coffin of, of FDA inspections. And if you think about it, companies say, well, our products are made in FDA inspected facilities. Well, for most of this year, that certainly is not going to be true. So there's a different level of accountability. That's a known fact. And the question is, who's accountable? And who's taking steps to ensure we have quality, safe drugs but also that we have an unrestricted supply of medicines when we need them, wherever we need them, for every patient, every time. So I'll stop there and uh, turn it back to Ryan and David. Thank you. Thanks so much, Rosemary. As a really excellent, insightful talk. And I'm uh, just gonna switch over here uh, to my screen. <clears throat> I think you actually transitioned it uh, extremely well for us to be able to talk a little bit um, about the quality side. Um, so I'll, I'll give uh, a quick talk uh, and quick overview of just Valisher, but then really going into uh, some background actually on NDMA that uh, Rosemary talked about from um, the perspective of that rocket fuel contaminant. Um, gets talked about a lot, so give a little bit of background on what NDMA actually is. Uh, and then go into uh, a lot of what Rosemary touched on in terms of the supply chain and uh, look at it from the lens of these contamination sources. Uh, look at one drug in particular uh, that's current problem or metformin top diabetes drug, uh, and then really get into the importance of independent testing and, and how this can apply broadly to uh, the pharmaceutical industry and healthcare industry as a whole. So first off, just really high level on Valisher. So Valisher, really our core concept at Valisher is independent chemical testing of medication and making that analysis very visible and transparent uh, in multiple ways, uh, but really for the patient uh, actually getting a certificate of analysis. And we're so used to in food having nutrition labels for everything but uh, and so many other marks of quality, uh, but in your medications, it's uh, often, as Rosemary says, 90% are going to be generic, comes in an orange bottle, uh, and has maybe a number written on it. And that's really all the information you have. Um, so it's, it's really a push for chemical testing. And in our pharmacy model, uh, we're buying the medications just like uh, any other pharmacy from distributors, from this giant global supply chain that's, that's certainly heavily reliant on China. And we do this novel approach of just simply chemically checking uh, what's going on in those medications before we're comfortable shipping them out 
uh, and those that pass uh, can be shipped direct to patients uh, coming with toxicity code analysis. To get a little bit into the, the contaminant that we've been discussing, which is uh, it's been found in rocket fuel, it's pesticide, it's actually currently used uh, to induce cancer in rats. Uh, it's, it's an incredibly potent carcinogen. And to give a bit of background on it, it's uh, actually one of the most studied carcinogens on the planet. It was originally uh, discovered in the 1950s. Uh, there's been United States Senate hearings uh, that included discussions on this particular contaminant, the nitrosamines in general, but on NDMA. Uh, there's a quote here from that particular hearing in 1977, uh, a nitrosamine, dimethyl nitrosamine, uh, which is one of the most potent carcinogens known, inducing liver cancer in rats. Uh, the World Health Organization and the United Nations held a summit on these carcinogens in 1978. And uh, the other part that's been done for decades is the analytical techniques actually be able to analyze this, uh, this chemical or these kinds of chemicals have also been around for 50 plus years. Uh, there's been dozens and hundreds of different methods uh, established for analysis of NDMA in food, beverage, soil, um, and certainly pharmaceuticals that's been studied heavily. Uh, here's just an excerpt from 1970 about uh, a particular method for the analysis of NDMA down to parts per trillion. Uh, a lot of what we talked about today is parts per billion. Um, and uh, we're, we're not gonna talk about all the various uh, drugs, but just a little vignette about uh, uh, Zantac and Nididine is that if you just search this drug and NDMA in Google Scholar, you'll find over 500 academic studies that have been looking and studying this issue of NDMA formation just in that drug. Um, so it really underscores uh, the depth of this area that has been studied. So the industry and regulators should not be surprised that all of a sudden um, there, there's an issue with this uh, new contaminant. Uh, it's, it's been well known for a long time. And to bring it to the industry and, and the supply chain as a whole, what you're seeing here is, is really just uh, a simple, well, it's simplified uh, kind of schematic of the supply chain. Uh, I think it really underscores just how incredibly complex uh, it actually is, uh, many different components throughout the world. And you, as an individual patient, are really at the end of all of it. Um, and uh, if you think about when you're actually getting a medication, uh, most drugs have often passed through many, many different hands throughout this whole chain, traveled thousands of miles, and are often a year or two old, actually, by the time that you receive them. And if this has obviously a lot of parallels to a used car and, and is honestly a pretty good analogy for understanding uh, and, and realizing the full implications of this giant supply chain. And uh, to think about this from the, from the side of China and uh, a lot of what Rosemary touched upon, if you zoom in on the active pharmaceutical ingredient component, which uh, obviously towards the beginning of this uh, whole chain um, has been mentioned before, roughly 60% of the global supply uh, of this component is uh, produced in China. However, if you go all the way back to the inputs, the fine chemicals and raw materials, as, as Rosemary was talking about, um, a lot of industry uh, professionals comment about how that's almost entirely China. Uh, so really uh, uh, this entire long system that ends up with us at the end is, is really heavily, heavily reliant on China. And in terms of looking at some of these chemistry problems and contaminations, um, uh, it really makes this root cause analysis pretty difficult. And uh, we'll focus on metformin again. Uh, Valsartan is another scenario of blood pressure medication um, where a lot of root cause analysis was completed and it was found that it was really the API uh, being manufactured and the use of various solvents uh, was, the, was the problem. But metformin, for the reasons we'll talk about in a second, might actually go all the way back into the inputs and uh, maybe that much harder to really find uh, the reasons uh, that currently the, the number four most prescribed drug in the United States, metformin, uh, is being broadly recalled for, again, this NDMA contamination. 
So to touch on that uh, a little bit, uh, we can look at the, the, the high level chemistry, obviously uh, the, uh, the full synthesis of these kinds of drugs and compounds is much more complex. Um, but if you look at, again, this NDMA molecule, uh, nitrosyl dimethylamine, <clears throat> you can see that it's really uh, based on two primary pieces, uh, the dimethylamine and the nitrosyl here. And if you look at the molecule of metformin, this dimethylamine is actually on the drug itself. So you kind of have half of this molecule uh, already there. And um, when, when producing the molecule itself, uh, it means that you actually have contamination, not just from the, the final manufacturing of, of the molecule, but perhaps all the way back to the, to the pieces that make this molecule could have themselves been contaminated as you're really just one step away from making this, uh, this carcinogen. And when we did our, our now pretty broad analysis of metformin, so we, we analyzed our own uh, pharmacy batches. We also did a crowdsourcing study where we had over 100 people from all over the United States send samples. Um, and when you looked at all those samples put together and looked at their contamination, um, it was quite an interesting, uh, really kind of shotgun story of uh, a contamination uh, dispersed all over the place. Uh, you had some companies that, that failed consistently, some companies that passed consistently, and then many companies that had uh, within the same labeling company uh, uh, batches that pass and batches that fail. Um, so obviously the full root cause analysis hasn't been done yet, but uh, it certainly leans on a pretty complex situation of how this contamination even got there in the first place um, and may very well point towards this immense complexity of the supply chain. And to delve a little bit deeper into the metformin story, uh, looking at the history specifically of testing, um, it, this year, uh, February was the first time that uh, the FDA released data um, on, uh, on uh, testing of metformin for NDMA under the, uh, the concern around this contamination. Uh, they released data on seven different companies uh, showing that all the batches passed. Uh, literally a day or two later, uh, Canada announced uh, recalls um, on some companies that also are sold in the United States. And uh, at, at roughly the same time, we actually got a sample of metformin from uh, an individual that, that sent us um, a sample where we analyzed and found extremely high levels. And so we decided to do a, a broad survey where uh, we analyzed 22 different companies uh, that we ordered through our, through our own pharmacy and sourced independently, and then ran our, our independent analysis, uh, found 11 of the 22 companies had issues. We filed an FDA citizen petition. Uh, the FDA did respond relatively quickly in, uh, in asking us to provide samples, which of course we, we voluntarily did so. And by May, uh, now the FDA has requested recalls and, and a whole variety of different companies have Conducted now uh, increasing number of recalls. It started with five. Now there's a sixth company. Some companies have expanded the recalls. And I think, unfortunately, we're, we're again in a similar situation uh, like the blood pressure meds where we're, we're having rolling recalls of uh, problematic batches and drugs. Um, but the actual story for metformin goes uh, earlier than that. So everything we talked about was in 2020. Uh, but in 2015, actually, uh, the FDA conducted uh, a few tests on metformin, uh, being that, as they claimed, it was a high-risk solid oral generic product. Um, and they tested 11 companies 13 times in 2015, uh, which actually accounted for almost 20% of all of their 2015 tests. So uh, a kind of important point um, that, that Rosemary was also alluding to is that you have all these facilities that are FDA inspected, uh, not so much this year, uh, but even when they are inspected, um, that is not a chemical analysis of the medications. They're inspecting the paperwork, they're inspecting the facility, and it's actually very rare that the FDA does chemical testing. And within an entire year, that the average number of tests that the FDA conducts is roughly 60 or 70. Um, within a year, I mean, we, we often in Dallas do that within a day. Um, but the uh, point is that here's the, the, the companies that they tested and everything in bold are companies that are currently doing uh, recalls today. 
Um, and in 2016, they did it again. Uh, so six more tests, uh, 7% of their uh, 2016 total. Uh, again, a number of companies that are now currently uh, recalling. And all these tests, including the ones from February, all passed. Um, there's even a link here if you, if you want to go into more details around the program. Uh, but the point is that it's, it's a really strong underscoring for, for the critical importance of independent testing. And you know, obviously, I've, I've said that a number of times, but what does this really mean? And uh, it, it can be uh, fairly nuanced in, in what's uh, uh, the, the kind of scientific details around it. Um, but uh, the bottom line is that independent testing uh, is really targeted towards answering the fundamental question is this a quality medication? And uh, this often uh, relies and follows the standard uh, regulatory FDA industry guidance, uh, industry tests, uh, but occasionally has to go beyond that. Uh, Zantac was a, a big case around that. By the way, we have some other webinars that really go into this, some of the more scientific detail on specific drug products uh, and the testing around that. Um, but uh, the important part is that we're trying as best as we possibly can to adhere to scientific best practice. And that is not always perfectly aligned with, with the regulatory industry standard. And this uh, is something that was the focal point of, of our uh, testimony before the United States Senate Finance Committee uh, just a month ago um, that really tried to delve into the, the oversight of this foreign drug manufacturing inspection process, these quality problems, uh, and, and a lot of the, uh, the issues that uh, Rosner was touching on as well. Um, and so a lot of the big question, uh, of course, from, uh, from the government side and from kind of the big picture industry side is how can we apply this concept of independent testing to the broader industry? And there's two quick elements to that that I'll touch on, which is uh, guidance for drug quality scores and independently certified drugs. So real quick on, on quality scores, uh, and there's just a really great paper that, that Ryan was a part of uh, along with uh, leaders at NYU Langone, uh, the Cleveland Clinic, and, and a variety of other uh, uh, leaders and, and institutions that came together to really put a blueprint of let's take evidence-based data so the chemistry data that Bausch is producing every day, uh, the regulatory data that's out there and all sorts of different drug products uh, and, and take all these sources and just boil it down into simple red, yellow, green guidance that can help inform buyers, payers, uh, and, and potentially individuals even on uh, what to try and choose, uh, at least have some visibility and transparency into drug quality. Um, you know, even if you're a big healthcare institution, when you're buying a generic, which is 90% of, of all the drugs that, that people are taking, um, all you see is, is the company and price. So to have another column in there of, of quality that, that's informed by real evidence-based information um, is something that has been talked about for a long time, but really needs to get done. And uh, something that we're pushing for and, and the whole uh, group of professionals are pushing for in terms of how this could actually work in a large healthcare system and in a buying group, uh, in a payer. Um, and one of the things that we found even in this initial work in this taper is that if you actually plot out uh, these values against price, there's no correlation. So just because something is cheap doesn't necessarily mean that it's poor quality just because it's expensive doesn't necessarily mean that it's good quality um, so this shouldn't make your medications more expensive this should just make uh, uh, transparency and, and make the buyers and payers of meds that much more capable of finding and and uh, rewarding quality products and quality manufacturers um, and then uh, a really a much more definitive approach. So the, the quality scores is guidance in practically any medication, any national drug code that's out there, but a more definitive approach for, for high volume, high impact, high risk drugs, which could be a variety of categories, um, comes into this concept of, of directly independently certified drugs, certified generics um, that uh, uh, really have a tremendous amount of value compared to the other options of just standard brand or generic. Um, and what we envision for that is really a system 
where you can take this, this scientific independent certification analysis process, layer it on top of what the manufacturers or the distribution industry is already doing. Um, and uh, those that pass now get an entire large batch, uh, you know, millions or sometimes even billions of pills at a time can be certified and can get a certification that goes throughout the entire chain and really ends up in the patient's hands uh, to see this visible, uh, transparent mark of quality. Um, and uh, with that, um, I'll, I'll wrap up uh, uh, as uh, to just uh, the general overview of, of the quality side and then the complexity of supply chain. Um, and happy to uh, hand it over to Ryan. Thank you, David, and thank you, Rosemary, for those presentations. I, we're going to move into the question and answer portion. So if you wish to ask your question verbally, uh, you can click the raise hand button. Um, and if you want to write your question, please do, a, do so in the Q&A section at the bottom of the Zoom screen. And while people are kind of formulating their thoughts, uh, I thought I'd start with a question for Rosemary. And I'm just curious, What's the most promising development in the area of overseas drug manufacturing that you've seen in the past year? Well, uh, I will uh, probably change the question and say, what's the most promising thing I've seen uh, recently? Uh, and I, I really like what Civica RX is doing, which is to address a problem that's been going on for 20 years that uh, has not been taken care of. And for those of you who don't know, Civica Rx is a nonprofit started by about 1,200 hospitals and health systems who chip in money to basically what I consider is creating uh, new suppliers, new relationships with trustworthy suppliers in trustworthy countries to produce essential drugs that are in shortage with full transparency on price, quality, where they're made. And they've figured out that you know shortages cost hospitals a lot of money. I was at a hospital the other day, and you know they have five people on staff, and all they all they do all day is to race around trying to find products. Some of it on a gray market, which is probably something you don't want to give to your kids or take yourself. So I've been impressed with uh, how we can solve problems, but what it takes is using our our money differently. Those hospitals are buying differently. They're putting their money into investing in quality products. And we need to do the same with our government and other entities. And that can help diversify the manufacturing supply chain to have to manufacturing in countries outside of uh, China and to have it, some of it close to home for when we need it during the next natural disaster or global pandemic. I think that's a, a great point of the, you know, un, unmeasured costs that these shortages cost, um, you know, healthcare systems and, um, you know, beyond shortages, even having to deal with some of these recalls um, oh. that, that have come about and, and the cost and, and the challenges we have even even doing a recall when, when we uncover these issues. So um, thank you. And um, David, a, a question for you. Are there any new quality concerns? Uh, around some widely used drugs that you're seeing emerge at this time? Um, so uh, we, we get asked quite often about uh, what are we seeing next? What else is coming down uh, you know, the, the pipe in terms of quality issues? Uh, and I'll say pretty broadly, I mean, we're, we're still currently rejecting uh, over 10% of the batches that we analyze in our own pharmacy for a whole variety of reasons. Uh, obviously, uh, a lot of attention gets paid, and I think rightfully so, to these contaminations and carcinogens. Uh, but we see failures uh, due to dosage variability, to dissolution, how pill actually dissolves. Uh, we've seen batches where the ingredients are incorrect. Um, so uh, th there's really a whole variety of problems, and, and what we see particularly concerning ones is when we delve into them deeply and do uh, broader reports that we often file as FDA citizen petitions. Um, and uh, and I'll, I'll say that, that we, we, we try to um, you know, act as quickly as we can on these as, as they come up. Uh, there was just in Europe uh, some reports of uh, another contamination in acetaminophen 
um, which is often used um, uh, for just general pain management and uh, you know, it goes by the brand Tylenol. Um, so as we hear of these, we also uh, actively investigate um, and when we have enough data uh, to really push for, for change, um, we, we file a public uh, report. Hey, Brian, can I jump in on that question? It's a great one, sure. building on what David said. Um, yeah, I got an email from um, uh, good people in Europe who, you know, their acetamin is called paracetamol. That's the name they use for it. And it turns out Europe doesn't, according to reports, Europe doesn't make it. It depends largely on China for it. And it was the media that did an investigation and had testing done of their generic acetaminophen sold in Europe. And a couple batches were tested, certainly much more is needed, but they found uh, what uh, academics uh, said were pretty significant levels of a different carcinogen. I think the story here is why is it, where are the regulators? Uh, why is it up to, uh, in this case, you know, investigative journalists to begin to ask the question and pay to have these products tested. We need a better system uh, in place uh, to protect the public, not only here, but uh, around the world. And I checked to see the FDA, I put this out on Twitter, uh, that the FDA, and, and what the source of it was apparently was a raw materials supplier or API supplier in, um, in China. And I looked on the FDA, uh, drug master file on that company has been approved to sell acetaminophen here in the United States, generic version. So, you know, I think the public needs to be reassured that somebody's looking out for them. I think that's a good segue into one of the um, audience co uh, questions, which was, is Europe doing a better job dealing with this issue? Well, I, I don't know about you, David, but I'll say it was, you know, Valsartan, that issue, I heard first in the European press, and the same with the acetaminophen. Yeah, so I, I, yeah. I'll just say in, in context, quick thing, in writing China Rx, I found the Europeans to be much more transparent and open and willing to help, and very grateful for that. So I'll, I'll certainly add to that, um, that uh, you know, Europe ha has, and the European Med Medicines Agency has certainly been pushing uh, a lot on trying to help solve these issues. Uh, they've uh, recently discussed uh, lowering uh, the limit for uh, that particular carcinogen that we're talking about, MDMA. Uh, the current kind of international limit is 96 nanograms. They want to push it to 30 nanograms, um, which I think underscores the, the proactive nature and the fact that you know we we, get, we talk a lot about these limits. Uh, this is a uh, case in Europe right now. There's there's dispute over the food agency versus the medicine agency over what the limit should be, but the reality is it should be zero. Um, you know there are clean ways to make these medications, um, and uh, this is this should not be part of the risk profile of whether a doctor is prescribing you a drug. Is how contaminated is it? Um, you know, that, that you shouldn't be taking any contamination risks in taking medications. Uh, but to, to get back to the, to the question around Europe, um, is, you know, th there's also a lot of fundamental differences in how uh, their healthcare systems work. You know, that's getting into a whole separate webinar, I'm sure. Um, but, uh, you know, a, a lot of these uh, countries, um, you know, will, will buy or source medications as a socialized healthcare system. Uh, themselves, you know, so you're, you're not just dealing with a whole bunch of companies in France. It is the country of France that is buying the meds. Um, and so that allows for also more centralized testing. Um, and, but when, when you're in the United States, uh, you know, there's uh, uh, thousands and thousands of facilities and, and wholesalers and intermediaries and, uh, you know, that schematic that we put up of the supply chain is really a simplification of the supply chain. Um, and so, you know, I think really what, what's needed uh, from, uh, especially in the pharmaceutical industry, and that we have in so many other industries, is this additional private sector layer. I totally agree with Rosemary on, on the regulators could be doing more, government should be doing more. I mean, we could look more towards the Europeans about what they've been doing. Um, but uh, ultimately, 
you know, if, if you're buying a used car, to take it back to that analogy, uh, you're, you're not just reliant on, on the government regulation on that car or on um, you know, the fact that the manufacturer originally said that it was okay. You want a 100-point inspection on that car that you're going to buy. You want a Carfax report. You want to look at J.D. Power & Associates. You want to, you know, th there's all these consumer angles for so many things that we buy. When, when you go down the organic aisle and you see those certifications, when you look for something to be gluten-free, when it locally sourced, you know, all these things that we're so used to in everything else that we buy and put into our bodies, but just does not exist at all uh, in, in medications uh, is a big part of what we're trying to change in, at Voucher. We're going to let um, uh, one of our audience members uh, ask a question themselves. So David Yang, um, I think I need you to unmute. Are you there? Yep. yep. Hello, Hello, David. Hi, uh, Rosemary, David, thank you so much for talking today. Um, question about the raw ingredients aspect. We certainly have the ability to spin out the manufacturing facilities domestically, but I'm curious, are the raw ingredients we currently rely on other nations? like? Is it possible at all to source these from the U.S., or are there some ingredients that we just simply won't be able to acquire ourselves domestically in this country? Uh, I'll jump in on that, David. Thank you for the question. I'm hearing that there are some uh, chemical plants that are uh, starting up here, and uh, that's a good sign. And I think that will happen more if we have uh, domestic manufacturing of finished drug here and API here. And that will create uh, demand from, uh, for local starting materials. Uh, I'd also suggest, and I've been an advocate of the Buy American, uh, to have some degree of domestic manufacturing for essential drugs, you know, the first 100, 200 most essential products. And if we had that, David, I think that would certainly spur not only finished drugs, but API and uh, potentially some uh, chemical plants. And I'm told by those who work in the industry that there's tremendous technology to reduce the environmental footprint on that. So uh, that, that's a good thing. Yeah. And I, I, and I, we don't have to bring everything back, but I, you know, what are the things that are most essential? And that's sort of a strategic decision that needs to be made. And, and I'll say, uh, you know, Dave, first, thanks for the question. And, and, and perhaps part of that question is also getting at, um, you know, are there just physical raw materials or resources that maybe we lack in the United States uh, naturally. Um, and I think from that perspective, um, you know, not being a complete expert in the raw materials, but um, from, from the scientific perspective, uh, th this isn't like, you know, electronics industry where you have a huge reliance on certain rare earth metals, you know, neodymium and, and uh, you know, these components that are uh, almost entirely sourced from China. Again, it's a question of, is that a natural resource thing or is it just where the facilities ended up? Uh, but uh, there's at least more of a reliance on, on, a, on a, a natural resource. Um, and from what I understand of it, you're, you're less limited on that on the chemistry side. Um, you know, a lot of these come from a petroleum industry uh, and various other manufacturing industries that we do have in the United States. And so raw fine chemicals did used to be in the US. Uh, th these companies, uh, there were some. Uh, I'm not sure there's any anymore. Um, but I, I don't believe there's a significant natural resource barrier to uh, producing in the United States. Thank you. That's a perfect analogy. Um, the second last question I had was, are there any policies that could incentivize manufacturing of generics over the current, like more expensive branded drugs and make this kind of, you know, chemical plants, generic manufacturing more economically favorable for the, the manufacturing facilities? Hey, I'll take a stab at that. There have been bills introduced in Congress by on both sides of the aisle to provide incentives for uh, domestic manufacturing with regard to having our taxpayer dollars for the VA, the Department of Defense, HHS, you know, they're the ones that buy directly and procure uh, generic drugs. And so there's this Buy America, in addition to that legislation that's um, being circulated, there's also a Buy American executive order that's been drafted that would, also, that would do just that. And so that would uh, not only give incentives to domestic based companies, but it would also give them customers because you and I can you know, invest in a manufacturing plant, but what we need are the customers. 
And so uh, the legislation that's been introduced and this executive order, uh, if signed, would um, actually give domestic companies uh, using our taxpayer dollars, public sector customers. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Rosemary. Uh, uh, one question I'm seeing a, a few times is, you know, what can the average non-professional or U.S. citizen do to help effectuate America's independence from foreign drug manufacturers? Well, I, I suggest a couple of things. Uh, one is that uh, people can find out where their own uh, or try to find out where their own prescription drugs are being made. And there's a couple tips in the appendix in, in China RX. You know, just if you go to a pharmacy and pick up a prescription, ask the pharmacist to show you the box and see what names are on it and call them up. And I was surprised some uh, companies will tell you, some will not. Uh, and I, I would say just uh, talk to your, your uh, pharmacists, your doctors, your friends, your neighbors, call up your member of Congress, call your senator. Those emails and calls make an enormous difference saying we have a concern here. And then as a last resort, I say, you know, if you want uh, products that are tested, you know, check out Valashore. Thanks, thanks Rosemary. And, and, and I'll say the, the other part of that, I think uh, uh, a lot from, from our perspective uh, at Valashore in terms of independent testing is that the reality of this $2 trillion global system is that we're going to be heavily globally reliant, you know, potentially forever. Um, and, and hopefully, you know, legislators and, and you know, this whole COVID crisis is a wake up that we need some amount of domestic capability. Um, and, uh, you know, having zero in certain areas, especially in antibiotics, is it's not just a quality concern, it's a, it's a national security concern. And the Pentagon's talked about this, obviously Rosemary's uh, testified about this. Um, and uh, there, there's, there's a lot of discussion on, on legislation around that. Uh, there's, there's announcement from this company, Flow, uh, of, uh, of producing uh, a certain really these high risk uh, medications now in the United States. There's a lot of backing from the government on that. I think this is all going in the right direction. Like we, we obviously need this, but um, just like with everything else you make, I mean, your, your iPhones are made in China. It's a very complex device um, that, that usually works. Um, you know, so it, it's, the point is it, it can be done and we are, we live in a global, you know, glo uh, world of globalization. Um, but, uh, and that's, that's largely fine as long as we have these elements of ensuring quality, of, of, of helping to ensure that everything that comes in is actually checked, uh, that regulators are able to do their job, and that there is uh, a market-driven push for making quality too. You know, part of having all of this independent uh, validations in, in cars, food, you know, all these consumer arenas, uh, the fact that you're, everything you buy at Amazon has, has uh, ratings on it, um, is to drive, is to be a market force towards, uh, towards its quality. You know, an independent, um, industry-driven, not just regulatory or, or you know, the manufacturer-driven, but uh, the consumer-driven element. Uh, and consumer and healthcare is, is all sorts of entities, obviously. But uh, I think that's the biggest part that's missing. And, um, you know, so as we try to bring a, at least a little bit more into the United States, uh, I think it is important to think big picture on the whole industry. Um, and uh, not to mention that there's been plenty of quality problems attributed to manufacturers in the United States, too. You know, we're, we're not immune from, from fraud in the U.S. Uh, or greed for just mistakes uh, in the U.S. So uh, you know, I really think that it's uh, important to, to have these uh, broad analytical approaches. All right, we have another audio question, and this is from Harry Lever. Harry, you need to unmute your line. Yeah. There you go. You know, uh, I treat a lot of patients with hypertension, and when I see somebody whose blood pressure has suddenly come out of control, the first thing I look at is what are they taking? Where did it come from? Who the manufacturer is? And I think that goes for another other conditions as well. And I think you 
rather than adding more drugs, you got to figure out what they're taking and try to go to one that you know works well. I'll just jump in on that. Uh, uh, Dr. Lever, thank you for that comment. You know, I, a lot of us grew up in an era where it was unthinkable that our prescription drugs would be made that were substandard or just not working. And we didn't have all these recalls. So we do have very, very serious problems. I'm hearing this from, you know, thoughtful, you know, informed people that they switch generics and something just doesn't seem to be working. And it's, it's unacceptable. And so independent testing is a part of it. But, you know, I, I'd love to take it a step further and I'd love to see a consumer reports type reporting uh, by company of those ratings. And that's a really quick way to turn around the marketplace. So it's not just, if I may say, inside baseball, but it's out there for the public. I know that opens up a lot of risk. I've talked about that, but if we really want to get things moving, you know, the other thing we have to do, frankly, is we have to restore trust in the American people and in doc among doctors because people are losing trust. And once you lose trust, it's going to take a long time to come back. And the best way to do that is to have uh, public reporting of these independent test results. And so that would be the ultimate answer in my view. Yeah, and, and so just to jump in on that, um, totally agree, and, and, and that's a lot of the driver that you know, Bowser does with these FA citizen petitions that are public, that put all of the information out there. And uh, I know is, is also a big driver um, for that paper that we talked about in drug quality scores, I think really gets at your point, Rosemary, um, that uh, you, know, you need this, uh, you know, maybe not a, a 20 page analytical, uh, you know, very technical uh, chemical analysis for everybody to look at, but just a simple star system or a simple red, yellow, green uh, that can be visible um, to consumers of healthcare. Uh, whether it's the Cleveland Clinic or whether it's an individual person. Um, and uh, totally agree. And, and I know, Harry, uh, you've obviously been, uh, talked a lot about uh, th this concept of the X factor, you know, from a doctor's perspective. Uh, you're, you're trying to get a patient the, the best possible treatment, uh, which has lots of considerations. That's why you spend all that time in medical school. And yet uh, now there's this uh, other element of was the drug made properly. Um, and so totally uh, agree that we need more visibility on that, more transparency on that, a, a consumer reports, a drug quality score. Uh, and, and I think a lot of that all stems from independent testing. And uh, you know, yeah, thanks, thanks again, Harry, for your time. Yeah, you know, what I'm struck by is that even with your data out there, David, from Valashore, you know, some manufacturers, they won't pay that attention. And the quickest way to turn that around is if that were public, publicly available and the public got to see it, right. th that, would, that would really turn around the market in terms of quality. Yeah, and, and I think to your, that actually an important point of that is a lot of what we talked about, these quality scores or even this independent certification you know, we, we make this data public, but how many people are going to, you know, the registry of you know, FDA sites where this data is there, um, or in regulations.gov, or even on our own sites and blog posts, obviously has limited amount of reach. Um, but the, uh, the, the concept of getting the industry actually starting to be involved in this so that your this kind of independent certification can go to an entire manufacturer's worth of metformin. And whether you're getting that drug from our pharmacy or any other pharmacy in the United States is gonna come with this certification you can actually see. Um, and, and I think that really starts to push this market consumer driven approach to seeing the quality. You know, even nutrition labels on food, that they weren't always there uh, and the industry fought it. They, they didn't want you know, and nutrition labels and the cereal boxes and, and everything else for, for the consumer to see it. But once the consumer is actively seeing it um, and engaged and, and has that trust, uh, to your point, Rosemary, um, I think it's, you open Pandora's box, you can't put it back, and consumers are going to demand it more and more and pay more and more attention to it. So I, I think that is a really important point, and, and we all have to work towards getting there. 
Our next question is from Jay Weller. Jay? Hi, can, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, do I need to press the space bar or something here? No, we can hear you. Okay, good. Um, I, I'm a strong believer in, in free markets, in free market economies, but unfortunately, we've turned a blind eye to some countries, and Rosemary Gibson, you've, uh, you've pointed that one out uh, very well to us, that have created an unfair market to the point where it has totally undermined our national security in terms of our pharmaceuticals and other forms of manufacturing as well. So how do we create a type of marketplace in this country where we reinvigorate and do it now rather than waiting for, well, the consumer driven type of market or some other kind of magic that's not really going to fall from the sky. We need to push this forward. We've, we're in the middle of a pandemic where it has displayed that, that our national security is really in trouble. And I'm seeing billions, if not trillions of dollars being thrown out by Congress right now. And I don't see one nickel going towards creating are rebuilding some of those factories that have been demolished over the last 25 or 30 years. It would create new jobs. Absolutely. I mean, there's, a, there's an old saying where if you, if you give a man a fish, you fed him for a day. If you teach a man how to fish, you fed him for a lifetime. Let's create some new jobs. These are good jobs, good paying jobs, good careers. Um, and you don't have to be a rocket scientist to, to, to to do, do this. So I just think that it needs to be done. And how do we, I mean, I'm, I'm sitting back here, but I see you people out in the forefront. You need to push something and push it now before we're in, in worse trouble than we are. Uh, uh, Jay, I, I can't agree more. And you'll enjoy also the vitamin C cartel uh, story in China RX where it wasn't just cartel formation for different products, but China actually used our federal court system to try to legitimize its cartels to fix prices and control supply. They were using ascorbic acid, the ingredient in vitamin C, as a test case. And actually, a federal appeals court agreed with China, and, which, and their decision effectively would allow China to form cartels and operate freely in the United States, where our companies would be subject to antitrust law. And by the way, not to just be Chinese companies, it could be other, other countries' companies. And there was no antitrust enforcement in the federal government through multiple administrations, Democrat and Republican. It wasn't just until recently that it was appealed to the Supreme Court with the support of the Justice Department and nine, um, the nine members of the Supreme Court in a decision led by uh, uh, Ruth Ginsburg uh, told the appellate court, you probably didn't get it right. It's been two years since that Supreme Court decision. We haven't heard from the appeals court. So we have a lot of issues to work through. You know, another thing I'd like to see, uh, Jay, is uh, we have some issues in our own country as well. I was uh, struck by a, a gentleman who actually is in plants that spent 30 years making medicines. And he went into a retail pharmacy to get a blood pressure medicine and it cost $157. And he said, I know what it costs to make that 90 day supply. I, I said, I know what the manufacturer would be paid. And he said, we'd be paid a dollar to make that 90 day supply. So in addition to quality transparency, we need transparency on, so where does all that money go? Where's $156 go of the amount that the customer pays? And the more that we can sort of lower the Let's make the, that supply chain smaller between the manufacturer and the customer. This is what uh, Civica RX has done. They're basically kind of fixing the marketplace and we need to expand that. I was really delighted to see that Kaiser Permanente recently joined with their 12, uh, 12 million uh, members will be getting their medicines from Civica RX. So that's a good sign. We need more of that. Well, so the first thing I'd like to see is get your hospitals. Do you participate in Civica RX where you can get trustworthy medicines made in countries that are by suppliers that are trustworthy. That's 
a big thing. You can, if you are in your communities, you serve on hospital boards or in leadership positions, if you have a platform. I've given grand rounds at a number of hospitals. I said, why do you tolerate this, these substandard drugs that are in perpetual shortage? Why do you tolerate it? And it's remarkable, the hosp many hospitals are silent about it for lots of reasons we can talk about offline, but it's just unacceptable. So um, we've got to keep going, but I appreciate your question, Jay. We, yeah, I'll just add in real quick that, um, you know, I think there, there is certainly an increasing push to do something. So yeah, Jay, to your point of, hey, we're, we're spending billions and trillions of dollars now on, on COVID, um, and you know what? What percentage of that is actually going towards uh, fixing pharmaceutical supply and, and quality and everything else? Uh, probably very small. But um, it, it has, because of the work that, that everybody's been doing, I think it has been um, at least starting to be addressed. You know, the fact that Flow got uh, three hundred fifty something million dollar. Uh, grant from the government to start to produce medications in the United States. And, you know, uh, 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 Martin from, from Civic and from Flow uh, was at uh, the, the Senate hearing last month uh, with us and was kind of being pressured about how, uh, you know, what are the results? And I think they got the grant like a week before. I mean, obviously it takes time to, uh, uh, to bring these concepts to fruition. So you need to invest now so that it can actually come fruition later and for the next pandemic, but I do think you're seeing some of that. Uh, I'll say there's also a, a recent announcement that one of the recent bills that, that just uh, passed in the House uh, included uh, finally giving the FDA mandatory recall power. A lot of people don't realize that currently the FDA can only request a voluntary recall on medications. They can do mandatory recalls on medical devices, uh, on food, uh, but unlike many countries around the world, they can't actually recall a drug. Um, and uh, we actually were at uh, the U.S. Capitol building on, on the introduction, uh, the reintroduction of the Recall Unsafe Drugs Act at the beginning of this year uh, by Congresswoman Rosa DeLauro. And uh, her staff actually managed to get one of these bills, essentially that power for the FDA. So hopefully it actually passes. But, you know, in, uh, in light of, of COVID and, and all these other recalls like hand sanitizer, methanol contamination recalls, uh, it, it actually has been helpful to push some of these successes. I think it's going to be up to all of us to continue that momentum um, uh, because this was obviously a problem before there was COVID. It's going to be a problem because of COVID and it's going to be a problem in the future if we don't do more. Thanks, David. And I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Um, one, one thing I think people are wondering about is how do you pick uh, what chemicals you test for uh, in, in some of your batches? And certainly there's, there's some that are common um, in your panel, but um, how do you decide what goes into that? So that's a great question. And um, you know, it's certainly true and I know the FDA is talking about this and, and a number of people have talked about this, that uh, you can't test for everything. You have to know what you're looking for before you look for it. Um, and, and although as a whole, that is true. And, you know, if you look at California's Prop 65, there, there's thousands of, uh, of compounds that could cause cancer. And obviously we can't analyze for all of those in, in everything uh, that comes to our pharmacy or even just uh, scientifically, that's uh, 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 would be extremely difficult. But point is, there are many that are more obvious than others. And so you do have to do some picking and choosing. And, and there's certainly no guarantee that just because we, we look for some of them, there could be some other problem in there. And, you know, we try to be very open and transparent about that, too. You know, we, we analyze samples of a batch. Uh, when we analyze a pill, it destroys it. So those exact pills that, that uh, somebody receives obviously weren't actually analyzed, but the batch is indicative of it. Um, and in terms of the actual compounds, you know, I think NDMA specifically or, or the nitrosamines is an excellent example of just something that's so obvious to look for. Um, and it's been talked about for decades and decades. It's one of the most potent carcinogens on the planet. Like obviously we should be looking for it there's been problems in medications with it for decades, Senate hearings, World Health Organization, United Nations, like all of that. Um, and I think that's one of the fundamental problems 
of uh, a largely self-regulated, you know, self-reported uh, uh, industry is that they can just choose not to look for it um, for, you know, whatever justification. And, and if you're looking at it independently, which academics have been doing for decades, they say, obviously, we should look at NDMA. And they looked at it for decades and decades and decades and hundreds and hundreds of academic papers that were unfortunately ignored. Um, and so, uh, you know, we, we do try to be as proactive as we possibly can. Uh, you know, last year we filed a petition on another carcinogen class called dimethylformamide. Um, you know, it's, it's the actual solvent that's been implicated in a lot of these carcinogen problems and is itself a group 2A probable human carcinogen. And we found it massive amounts, over, over a thousand times higher than what we're talking about in NDMA. Uh, and is also, by the way, a huge problem right now in uh, metformin. Actually, there's, there's such a massive contamination of dimethylformamide that it actually makes the data noisy to be able to analyze it for NDMA. And that's the current uh, subject of, of the scientific debate uh, we're having with FDA right now over the analysis of metformin. But, but the bottom line is that there are areas that are more obvious than others. Uh, we're doing as much as we can to, to try to be proactive not just about analyzing uh, you know, thousands of different medication products, but also looking in the areas that, that make the most uh, sense, taking our best guesses and what to look for next. So David and Rosemary, we, we have so many questions. Uh, we're gonna, if it's okay with you, we'd like to stay on until 1.40 today. Is that okay? We'll give it another 10 minutes. Sure, thank you. Thank you. Sure. Um, hey, Ryan, why don't you and I go back and forth on, on the, the questions in the, in the chat, and I'll start. Um, uh, does, uh, let's see, oh, here's one, David, I think you'll find very interesting. Is it possible to manufacture ranitidine safely? Will it ever be back on the market? Ah, so I would um, highly recommend, we have, we have another webinar where we delve into some of these issues a bit deeper on the chemistry side, and, and I'll, I'll just say that uh, the problem with grenitidine, um, you know, commonly known as Zantac, uh, is that there's, there's a, the molecule itself is unstable. Um, so what we're seeing with metformin, what, we, what you saw with, with valsartan, losartan, herbsartan, a lot of these other contamination issues uh, was uh, when it was manufactured, there was um, a contamination in the manufacturing process. And, and you, know, you saw the supply chain schematic. It's very complicated to figure out where it's coming from. But um, I, I seriously doubt uh, ranitidine is coming back because as the FDA has now finally uh, also agreed um, in their statement in April, taking it entirely off the market, that this is an unstable drug. And that's what we said last year. Uh, that's what we showed all of the data on. And because the drug itself is so unstable, and actually those uh, both of those components that we were talking about before on NDMA, you know, the, the N and the DMA, the dimethylamine and the nitroso uh, as a nitrite uh, on, on ranitidine, are present on the drug. Um, and so it, it, there's so many different ways it could form NDMA specifically, and not just at manufacturing, uh, also in transportation and shipping. Uh, there's another citizen petition filed by Emory Pharma. Um, uh, that uh, that showed that specifically, that FDA talked about it. Um, and what we continue to research at Morris Sloan Kettering Cancer Center um, is uh, the next step, which is actually when you put it in your body. And, you know, you can imagine that uh, the drug is so unstable that it forms this carcinogen even just in manufacturing or in storage, but your body is essentially a giant chemical reactor. Um, and for such an unstable drug to be exposed to, to your stomach, to thousands of enzymes throughout your body, um, gives so many opportunities for instability. And there's also so many alternatives to this drug uh, in the H2 antagonist uh, uh, category, in the PPIs, and proton pump inhibitors, um, that uh, I would be very surprised if it came back. Long story short. Thanks. David, uh, another question is, you know, we, we see how this is impacting the drug supply. Does this go beyond, um, you know, to the food supply in, in, in other areas uh, with some of these quality and safety concerns? I don't know, Rosemary, if that's something that, that you've come across. 
on the on the food side, I'll just say you know the FDA is supposed to uh, conduct ins food inspections from here in the U.S. and food coming in from other countries, and that's not uh, taking place. And we they're real. I don't see much uh, robust um, either independent testing or FDA testing of the food that we consume. I know Greenpeace uh, did a an analysis of things like goji berries that were uh, coming from China and they found multiple, multiple pesticides uh, on them and other food products. So it's, it's, it's a wild west uh, and we don't have the same vigilance when it comes to our food as, mu as much of a challenge as we've heard about today with our prescription drugs. I think food is much more uh, concerning. To say real, real quick on food is, is there are some fundamental differences uh, on food versus pharma um, that uh, I think actually makes it inherently a pharmaceutical industry much more difficult uh, to find problems, which is when, when you eat food or you become sick from food, it's, it's much more clear. You are healthy and then all of a sudden you became sick. And so a lot of these you know, E. coli outbreaks and lettuce problems that, that we hear about practically every Thanksgiving uh, or other times um, are, are much more straightforward to trace. Uh, however, with a medication, uh, you, know, you already had a condition for which you're taking medication for. And so actually to get back to that you know, X factor um, that Dr. Lever uh, often talks about and, and was, was talking about today, um, it's, uh, it's that much easier to get lost in the noise when you have a medication problem. You know, did, did your blood pressure get worse uh, because of you know, 100 other factors, your diet, your exercise, or anything else that's going on with the condition, or was it the actual medication? It, 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 there's a lensing problem there that I think makes it very difficult uh, on, on the pharma side. And I think also, uh, apart from FDA, you also have the USDA. I mean, if you, if you process meat in this country, there is a USDA agent and inspector at that facility every day. Uh, you don't have that in, in, in pharmaceuticals, even in domestic uh, manufacturing uh, on pharmaceuticals. You know, maybe they get an inspection once every two years or so, I think is the target. Um, very different from having an inspector at the plant every single day, which is perhaps not for all food, but in certain categories of food, uh, and as USDA, uh, I know does that. So Just, there are some fundamental differences, uh, but the point is that additional vigilance is, is needed everywhere. Just on a quick thing on that, I, there's a chapter in China RX about our chicken, and there's a, been a push for like 15 years to import chicken from China. And if that happens, and I, I, think, it, I think it some of it is beginning to come in, that the USDA will not be in the plants in, in China to do inspections. Mm. And consumers won't have any label on them to indicate where the product is coming from. So it's, you know, I've seen globalization can be a form of deregulation, and I think that's what we're seeing here, and it applies to food as well as medicines. Yeah, and, and as you mentioned, supplements as well, even though they're they're regulated somewhat different, uh, uh, but um, you know, certainly food, drugs, and supplements are uh, all, all things that need to be looked at. And medical, uh, I, I medical see, devices. <laughs> oh yeah, yep. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I see a comment in here in, in a few, um, you know, patient concerns um, related to, you know, they were taking a certain medication and they've had to switch due to a shortage. Um, and I just kind of wanted to validate that, you know, that's certainly an issue as a pharmacist that I see. And, and I see it um, is something where healthcare professionals as a whole need to be aware of these issues uh, because we, it's hard enough uh, to get uh, patients and people to take their medications uh, as directed. Uh, and I think these issues that you bring up just, just complicate that. And pharmacists sometimes are not in positions where they can control the purchasing. Uh, sometimes we can. And I think it's a good opportunity uh, for healthcare professionals to partner, which I think works towards building trust with patients to kind of raise some of these issues. I, I think there are things that I as a healthcare professional can do, uh, but it really helps when I go along with a patient um, who can speak and um, you know, raise these issues with me. Uh, so I, I just wanted to validate that I, I see that as a, a comment. It's certainly an issue with, uh, I know there was a 
article in the um, Journal of uh, Cardiology, and um, it, it did. It was able to identify that after the Valsartan recall, um, people did stop taking their medications uh, uh, with some of the blood pressure meds, and they saw an increase in emergency department utilization. So this can have real-world impacts on, on patients, and I. I um, you know, agree that it, it's really important that, you know, we're aware of this issue and, and work with patients um, to, to figure out what to do. And sometimes it just isn't available. I saw on social media that a prominent federal official uh, said that his blood pressure medicine was on back order for three months. So some things, sometimes your hands are tied. One thing I'll add is a tip for people. Um, sometimes the inactive ingredients can be different among generic drugs. And uh, I've sent people to Pillbox. I've never used that myself, but that apparently lists a lot of the inactive ingredients in uh, prescription drugs. And I actually did that with, with someone and she noticed that her husband was allergic to some, one of the inactive ingredients and they switched back to the other generic and it really helped. So it's also good to take a look at the inactive ingredients. Great point. Uh, Peter, I'm gonna turn it over to you uh, to either um, you know, bring the final question or to, um, you know, close this out. So sure. um, over to you. Well, I, I'm going to do one last question, which is, um, does the China monopoly factor into the rapid run up in insulin prices or is that an artifact of the U.S. market? I don't know the answer to that. Um, I can certainly imagine we've seen this with, um, other products that it could be a function of what's going on right here in the U.S. market from the time it gets from the manufacturer all the way to the consumer. I think we need transparency on that. Where's that money going? It's like the, the farmer, how much does he get paid for that gallon of milk uh, versus what we pay at the grocery store? And I think we need to invest more in you know, quality manufacturing um, to really add value to the uh, patient experience and actually have medicines that are as they should be. All right, well, that concludes today's uh, webinar. Thank you so much to our panelists. Thank you to all of you who attended. We had, um, we, we've had a lot of people interested in what, what you guys uh, had to say across the country, some from China, in, in fact, uh, in Europe as well. So, and the questions were excellent also. Thank you, Ryan, so much. Uh, for, for moderating today's event uh, and, and for your insightful questions. Uh, we will be broadcasting this event or, or publishing this event on our YouTube channel um, and in other places. We will be holding other uh, Valisher video seminars in the future. So uh, thank you all for attending. Thank you to our panelists and have a great day. Thank you.